Welcome to School Site Podcast, RM. I'm laughing because we just use this new 30 second countdown feature and it uh, doesn't take much for, for me to have a giggle about that. But anyways, I am Rachel. I'm, I'm a school psychologist in Maryland. We're really excited to have um, Dr. Sharp here uh, with us tonight. And we've been on his podcast two times now and um, are members of the, his Facebook group and um, see some really good stuff going on there. So I'm um, super excited, but I'm gonna pass it over to Rebecca who's gonna tell everybody how to participate tonight, Rebecca. Yes, hello everybody. I'm Rebecca, I'm a school psychologist working in the state of Connecticut. And I'm so excited that you're here watching us live. If you log right onto your YouTube account, you can comment in the window in the chat right alongside the video. And if you do, your comments will stay with the video for posterity. So just know that. And sometimes we flash them across the screen. We love your participation, your thoughts and your questions. If you'd like to send a private message or if you have a question that you don't want um, attached to the video, you can message us on School Psyched podcast page on Facebook or on School Psyched, your school psychologist or on Twitter at, at podcast site. We look forward to listening and talking with you. And now I'm gonna hand it off to Eric who's gonna introduce our wonderful guest. Thanks, Rebecca. Hi, everyone. I'm Eric, and I'm a school psychologist also practicing in the state of Connecticut. And we have two and a half more days until winter break, so I'm very excited, but also more excited to have this conversation with Dr. Jeremy Sharp, who has been a friend of ours for, I guess, a couple years now. We were guests on uh, Jeremy's podcast, The Testing Psychologist, and uh, we've been guests uh, twice, I think. And so we really were looking forward to having further conversations with Jeremy and getting to him as a guest on our podcast to talk about his uh, work through the testing psychologist community and private practice. And Jeremy has sort of built a practice around supporting other psychologists and developing a community of support. And all of this has come through uh, his, you know, sort of navigating the private practice world with its ups and downs and its stresses. And so as school psychologists, it, depending on what state you're in, and of course, there are people who are audience members who are not school psychologists, but licensed or um, are just members of the psychological community who listen. Um, but we have opportunities to private practice as well as school psychologists. So uh, this is, we thought this would be a great opportunity for Jeremy to tell us what he does and for us to connect with his community as well. So welcome, Jeremy. Uh, Jeremy Sharp, I should say, is a licensed psychologist, uh, holds a PhD, and you are in Colorado, I believe. That's right. So welcome, Jeremy. And can maybe we'll start off just by asking you to tell us about this backstory. How did you begin the testing psychologist community and what were some of the lessons learned and ups and downs that you went through uh, building this? Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, first of all, thanks for having me. It's great to great to be here and be able to repay the favor from the podcast that y'all have done. It's always, always nice to hang out with y'all. So thanks for bringing me on. So yeah, I mean, to, to tell the story of the testing psychologist, I, I kind of have to tell the story of my private practice, which started um, back in 2009. Um, so 2009 was a big year for me. Um, this was when I was finishing up my postdoc. Uh, it was when the year that I got married. Um, I was training for a marathon, I think, over that summer, and I was about to take the licensing exam. So there was a lot going on in those months from like July to September of 2009. But one of those things is that I started my practice. So back then I just started it uh, on my days off for my postdoc. I got to take one day off a week and knew I wanted to uh, uh, to work in a, uh, the town that we lived in. My wife was pretty well established there, um, but I couldn't find any jobs uh, in our town for a PhD level psychologist. So I kind of say that I started my practice out of necessity and I really didn't know what I was doing at all. So um, back then, there were very few, there weren't all these podcasts and, you know, resources like y'all have, or even, you know, blogs, or I mean, there really wasn't a ton except for Google. And so, you know, I just remember, you know, I'd started this practice and um, I ended up uh, graduating from my postdoc. And then it was just like, 
private practice, but I really didn't know what that was or what that was supposed to be. I just knew that I needed to do something because I didn't have a job. And this really uh, came to a head. I, you know, tell the story about the morning after our wedding, you know, we had kind of been building up to this whole experience and there was so much excitement and I kind of forgot that I didn't really have a job, but we woke, I woke up the morning after my wedding and you know, everybody was gone. There was no celebration and just like lost it with my wife. You know, it was like, I don't have a job. Like we don't have any money. What am I going to do? You know, just this like total, total breakdown moment. And uh, luckily she didn't leave me uh, right at that moment. And she stuck with me. And yeah, so from there, I just, you know, I say I made a ton of mistakes uh, so that hopefully other folks don't have to make as many mistakes when they're starting their private practice. So, yeah, I launched my practice, um, you know, fast forward probably four or five years. Uh, I got to the point where uh, I was fortunate enough for things to, to be going well in the practice and was starting to get a little bit of that uh, kind of like been there, done that uh, sense and got antsy and decided to, to hire a business coach to figure out where to go from there. And through that process, came to, you know, I knew that I love teaching and um, my business coach had the foresight to say, why don't you start a podcast? There's really nothing out there in the podcast world for folks uh, who want to run, who want to run a testing practice. So that's a very, very long version of how it came to be. But, but that was it. I knew I love teaching and I wanted to do something different to kind of give back. And so uh, that was that. And now here we are four or five years later. Wow, that, I love that story, and it sounds um, really scary. <laughs> that next day, the day after, I cannot almost imagine how you must have felt when you describe it. So, um, having the business coach, did that? How, how did that help you um, understand things about starting a practice that that you wouldn't have imagined? Because in my head, when I think about starting a private practice, I kind of figure i only think about like billing and learning about insurance and scheduling and i really don't think about much else other than that but i although i'm sure that i'm wrong and there's lots of other parts what were some unexpected things that you learned um by working with him or her yeah great question so i mean you name the the easy stuff that's the stuff that's right in front of our face right but what i focused on a lot and what i end up talking with now my own um consulting clients about is really management of time and how to um, not work too much. You know, I think we, when we think about starting a practice, there's that question of how do I get clients? But what I found is a lot more troublesome is what do I do with all these clients once they start coming? Um, it was really easy for me to just keep taking clients and just, uh, you know, like the hours each week just expanded um, exponentially, it seemed like, and I was working weekends and, you know, the toll on family and, and so forth. So I worked with my business coach a lot to just pare things down and really figure out how to delegate, how to streamline, how to hire people where I needed to, um, so that I was really only doing the work that I should be doing, which is the clinical piece, basically. So that was the biggest thing I took away. Now, I, I'm try I've am i kind of had thoughts of, okay, may maybe I could do private practice one day. And in fact, I, I got went through the licensing process when I was in North Carolina, and that was just working with the psych board there. They, were, they required a lot of documentation, my old syllabus from, from previous coursework, um, bios from previous professors, um, you know, letters from internships and practicums and things like that, that I hadn't been in contact with these people for a long time. So it was a very overwhelming process. I know it's different state by state. When I came to Maryland, it seems a lot easier here. Um, so I'm assuming that that's the first step is figuring out your state and um, what, I mean, lots of school psychologists don't have the doctorate and might be working as like a psychological associate or working under um, a, a doctoral level psych. Um, so is that the first step? And if not, like, well, and then after that, what, what do you do? How do you get started? <laughs> yeah, yeah, certainly. Yeah, I think that is the first step. Um, you have to, you have to know how you can practice. And those state by state guidelines are different, um, especially for school psychs, you know, who might 
fall um, in a little bit of a gray area, depending on what degree you have, right? Um, so there are some states that allow kind of independent um, master's level folks to practice um, and do testing and um, go, you know, go under the title psychologist and so on and so forth. Um, there are some states where, yeah, you'd have to become like a psych assistant um, and they call, you know, call it different names in different states. And then there are some states where, you know, even with a PhD in school psych, you um, maybe have restrictions on practicing clinically. Um, so, you know, it really runs the gamut and you just, yeah, I think that's a great first step is just check with the licensing board and see exactly what you can do. Um, now, after that, that opens up um, a whole discussion, you know, a, a, a series of steps that that you can go through to to get into private practice. I mean, there's the um, I call it the boring stuff, but the necessary stuff that you have to do, which is, um, you know, for example, setting up a uh, business entity with your secretary of state. So um, that's pretty easy. In most states, it's, you know, you do it on the website. It costs a small to medium size amount of money, um, depending on the state. And it's usually pretty quick and you can register your business. You just have to think of a business name and there you go. You know, you have a business. It's actually shockingly easy in many states to, to just start a business, which is uh, kind of terrifying in some, some regards. But, but you have to do that. Um, so setting up your business entity, um, and then that kind of flows downhill. Once you have your business name and, uh, you know, uh, um, a tax entity, basically, then you can do all the, all the other things that you have to do. So, um, I'm a big fan of, uh, making sure that you have all your ducks in a row in terms of paperwork and, uh, logistics before you start to do the fun stuff. Like, building a website, um, you know, doing branding, doing logo, you know, doing um, social media, you know, anything like that. Um, I always, always think it makes more sense to, like I said, get the, the basics out of the way before you start down those other paths. Um, but they're all options. And I think they're all helpful when you're going into private practice. But when you really get down to it, you just need a business entity and you um, <laughs> need a license to practice. And you know, these days you may or may not need a space, but most of the time you need a space to practice as well. So finding an office is important too. I know that NASP recommends a couple of different insurance companies mm -hmm. and um, they offer, I guess, you know, good rates for school psychologists. However, um, I guess de how much insurance you need <laughs> kind of depends mm -hmm. on some other things, right? Like how many clients you have or what kind of work you're doing. How, do you know, like, how do you, deter do you determine that with the insurance company or is there some other way to decide how much? Yeah, yeah, so liability insurance is important. Um, that's one of those pieces you need in place before you start. So in my experience, all the insurance companies are gonna walk through that process with you when you apply. And even when you renew each year, so there are always options to uh, put in how many hours you're working each week and how um, how they break down, you know, the delineation of responsibilities. And the rates vary, you know, if you're part time, then you pay less and that's always nice. But yeah, they'll help you out with that process. You don't luckily we don't have to decide. Um, I will say this. I mean, most um, most you know, insurance panels or contracts that you might uh, get set up in your private practice with a, with other agencies or practices are going to re require like a, uh, you know, they call it a 1 million, 3 million um, limit on your liability insurance. So that's, you know, that's just a little bit of guidance to make sure not to go below that. Okay. Um, it's so interesting to me because I was mentioning before we went live, I work for a private practice as an independent contractor after school. So it's it's super easy. I um, I have an LLC in the state of Connecticut and um, got my uh, license as a professional counselor. So those things help me, but, um, mm -hmm. but it's a very, you know, sort of limited number of hours and, and things. And the first thing I noticed working outside of a school, of course, were the things that were harder um, <laughs> than working within a school. I feel like I'm so comfortable in my role in the school 
and I have so many collaborators. You know, if I need, if I learn something about um, how to help a, a student or, or you know, something, some insight that that I know would be important for the teacher, I can just find the teacher at some point and, and talk mm-hmm. to the teacher. Or if it's you know what whatever the issue is, I just, I have so many people that I can instantly bring together. And it felt a little bit as I started working out, outside of school. Um, two things: one, it, it feels a little bit more isolated, like, it, and it feels like you're you're the emergency person in a way because in the school, when I need more help or when I feel like a child needs more help in some area, I can refer out. And then once you're the outside person, it felt it felt a little intimidating that way. And I don't know if you've ever worked in a school, but could you speak to that a little bit about sort of being your own one person um, support of a child and how you how you are able to connect with other stakeholders? Yes, that is huge. That's um, one of those things on my uh, why not to go into private practice slide. Uh, one of the big ones is practicing in isolation. I mean, it can be really hard emotionally and just practically, right? Like if you are the, the go-to, you're the emergency person. So. There are a couple ways that I've worked with that over the course of um, being in private practice. When I was uh, early in practice and did not have the the group environment that I do now. So our practice now is about I think eighteen or twenty clinicians. You know, so there we have a nice like critical mass of testing folks. You know, or or even you know folks doing therapy to consult with. And so we do regular consultation meetings within our practice. And there's always the ability to walk down the hall and. And that sort of thing. Um, when I did not have that, though, uh, one of the priorities was finding a consultation group. So I was I was actually part of two consultation groups for the first probably three or four, maybe even five years that I was in private practice, um, where you know we met at least every other week, and just knew that you know I had I had those individuals to count on if I really needed clinical support or was feeling. Kind of emotionally isolated, um, but you have to seek those out. That's that's one of those things that's easy to just get going in practice and then find yourself in a sticky situation one day. Um, that's good to know. I hadn't thought about that. So is that the norm then that that uh, private practitioners have kind of like a, a PLC, like a, a group that they go to? Like I'm always bothering Eric and Rebecca on cases <laughs> that I need to help with. So that's the norm. People are talking and collaborating. Yeah, in a group like ours, yeah, it certainly is. I mean, that's part of the culture that we have built, and that's a part of the expectation. When folks join our practice, they know that they're kind of obligated to go to consultation meetings twice a month. Um, So we kind of build that in. Uh, I know groups run differently. Uh, So if that's something that that y'all might be interested, anybody, you know, if you're thinking about going into private practice or joining a group in some some form or fashion, that's certainly something to ask about, you know, what's the peer support look like and what's the consultation look like? I don't know if it's the norm or not. I hope it is. Awesome. I see we have a viewer question. Nick uh, posted a question that I was thinking myself too, this in light of COVID, um, how has that impacted practice? Um, And can you tell us a little bit about that? Yes. Yes. We were just, we were talking about this before we jumped on live, right? So I found that it's been, there's, there's sort of two ways to look at it. Um, the therapy side of our practice has been absolutely, uh, inundated with referrals. Like we cannot, um, see people fast enough and we're running out of people to refer to. I feel like all the therapists around, around the area are full, um, which makes sense, right? People are stressed out. Um, they're isolated. They're reaching out for support. Um, testing, on the other hand, was a little bit more of a roller coaster. Um, you know, early on, we shut testing down completely because we had no idea how to do it remotely and uh, couldn't do it in person safely. Um, so we shut that down for a month or two, maybe. And then, you know, we had to figure out how to do remote, like direct to home testing, um, did that for a little while. And then we figured out how to do like in office kind of hybrid testing with masks and PPE and, and so forth. Um, but now, you know, we're fortunately in an area that's, I think, relatively lower numbers than some parts of the country. Um, and we and now the testing referrals are um, are uh, either right back where they were or probably even more. I think we're kind of looking further out than 
usual with testing. Um, so on the whole, it's been busier, I guess is the short story. I know that by me, some of the, um, some of the districts in Maryland are seeing uh, children for testing, bringing them in with PPE. My district is doing that and doing the remote assessment. And then some counties have said, no, they weren't equipped to it. They weren't comfortable, whatever. And so they're not testing children. And so what I've been hearing is that a lot of them, a lot of parents are going to private practitioners who are open for business or, you know, if you're not going to work with my son or daughter, you know, I'm going to go elsewhere type of thing. So, um, yeah, I imagine it kind of depends on the status of the school system and what other practitioners um, around you are doing, but that's mm -hmm. that's interesting. That's such a good point. One other thing I might add to that as well is that, um, you know, I've heard that, um, I don't know how widespread this is, but I've certainly heard a lot of anecdotes about um, folks who are private pay in private practice have had a little tougher time, um, you know, as people uh, sort of trim their budgets a little bit, uh, you know, going through what we've all been going through. So um, that's that's just something to keep in mind. We have a primarily insurance based practice. So that's um, that's helped, I think, quite a bit here. Yeah. But that's a great question. Yeah. yeah we had another viewer asking um, what particular steps you're taking uh, to ensure mm. safety during assessments. How's that, mm. how's that going? What's that looking like? Oh my gosh. Yeah. I mean, it feels like a moving target, uh, to be honest, uh, depending on the, you know, the week or, or the day sometimes, but yeah, I mean, I, I don't know that we're doing anything out of the ordinary compared to, um, any, you know, any other sort of healthcare business. We've got all the standard, um, you know, masks required, um, hand washing, hand sanitizer, um, temperature checks, you know, all that kind of stuff. We, uh, we make people uh, sign a waiver before they come in for their appointment. Um, we have waived uh, cancellation fees. You know, folks do get sick and don't want to come in. That's totally fine. So we're a lot more flexible with that. But then, I mean, gosh, I don't, I don't know how much detail we want to get into with you know we're we're just being very careful with sterilization and cleaning of testing materials um just the lysol wipes all over the place and the spray and the alcohol wipes and you know and all that kind of stuff with you know the blocks and the uh, stimulus books and everything that everybody's touching you know all the time we're just like wiping down all the time um but related to that you know with the time it takes a lot of time, you know, so we are budgeting, you know, an extra hour for our assessments um, just to do kind of clean up and set up and clean up to make sure that, that things are safe. I, I like your, your comment about waiving cancellation fees and I had not thought about that, but that makes so much sense. You don't want somebody coming in for an assessment, you know, taking some Tylenol, knowing that they're sick because they don't want to lose their money. So uh, yeah, <laughs> that's a good idea. Right. Now, one of the things, you know, that I think is awesome about being in private practice is the flexibility. That's probably the biggest attraction for, for many of us, certainly for me. Um, and part of that is, you know, I know some psychologists who are, for example, testing outside, you know, if they live in uh, environments where that's possible, they can test outside at the client's house or at their office if that they have that set up. Um, so there, there's a lot of flexibility if, if you're kind of willing to, to take those measures. Yes, I've done some testing outside at my schools too, and before um, the weather got a little bit too cold. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I know. It was good. I know. Um, we had a comment going on. I wanted to share that I, on your Facebook group too, um, I see a lot of people posting, especially earlier on mm -hmm. their, their own office setups with COVID and stuff and some really kind of interesting kind of fixes for some stuff. So I think that that was good to see. And then we had a question. Um, Okay, so I think this is taking us a little bit out of COVID, but um, the beginning steps that make the most difference for acquiring uh, clients early on. Thoughts on that? Yeah, yeah, certainly. Yeah, we can, I love talking about that. So, you know, when I think about, to me, that kind of falls under the umbrella of marketing, right? And how you just, how you get clients. So I think of it in terms of two, there are basically two ways to go about it. There's the in-person route, and then there's the digital route. And whether you do one or the other or both depends on a few factors. Um, if you 
for example, are transitioning out of the school and you're going to be practicing in that same community, I think that gives you a huge leg up um, with the in-person um, kind of warm referrals. So I always think about, you know, the in-person, the in-person marketing is really just building and fostering and nurturing relationships. I mean, that's, that's what it's all about. So, you know, if you have those relationships built in, then it goes a long way. Um, with that, though, you also, you have to be really clear about what you're doing and your intent and, and what you're hoping for. So, you know, being, um, being willing to put yourself out there and really say to people like, hey, I'm jumping into private practice and I would love to uh, see any kids that you think would, you know, would be appropriate. And that's, that's something that is hard for a lot of people, especially I think transitioning out of agencies, because we just don't have to do that, you know, when we work other places. Um, yeah, that's all Rebecca. Yeah. I think, I, yeah, I, I love what you said about relationships, because I know on the other end, at school, we're looking for referrals all the time for for counseling or for testing or for various um, things. And there, we have a small, you know, um, sort of group of, of referrals that we've had relationships with these people over the years. And the you know our our students and their families have been happy. But now, um, when there's an increase in referral needs. I've been finding that people, you know, people used to just sort of mail their resume to us, um, which isn't so helpful, you know, like I, usually I would just put them in a drawer or, or not look at it, but, but the people that either took the time to call or, you know, that really um, made a good first impression and made me want to get to know them, um, that was really helpful. So I would say to anybody out there, get to know your school mental health folks because we, we need your names and um, and the more the stronger that relationship uh, is the better for the student really um, in the end and the family so I would make that suggestion for sure yeah yeah I think especially early on in your practice when you presumably have a little bit more time because you, you know you maybe aren't full with clients um, it's a great time to just build in those practices of you know, like we in our prior, when I started and now, you know, the rest of our clinicians, like we do school observations for most of the kids we're evaluating and we connect with teachers and connect with the school psychologist and the principal sometimes. And, you know, over 10 or 12 years, you know, it's almost like compound interest. Like the more people see you, the stronger it gets. And then that, you know, they, they trust you more and vice versa. Like I can talk about schools in the district to parents better. So, so, you know, those little things go a long way, even if you don't think of it as like marketing, you know, you're not like networking with them exactly, but it is building relationships and that, that goes a long way when people need a referral. Yeah, the observation thing I think is key because I so rarely see that that we have outside. It's usually the private practice person kind of writes a report there's all these recommendations of things that the school should do. <laughs> and that uh, it kind of rubs the school staff a little bit wrongly because maybe they didn't talk to the teacher. They didn't talk to, you know, they, they haven't been in there to see what it's mm -hmm. like. So I think that's so appreciated if somebody who's willing to, you know, get in the car and drive and come on into the school and go through that process and see the kid in, in the learning setting, um, to me, like speaks a lot. So that's awesome that your practice is able to do that. For sure. Yeah. Yeah, and one thing that's super simple that um, we always or I always try to build into conversation with teachers or school staff is just that question, like, what would you really like help with with this kid? You know, if there's anything that we could put in this evaluation to help you, what would it be? And then it gives you nice, you know, it's a nice sort of direct line to you know, being helpful, which is always good in this whole process, right? So, and yeah. I, I think... Um, I, I'm not sure how many your of your evaluations end up being um, independent school requests, like what we call mm -hmm. IEEs in Connecticut um, versus uh, parent referrals. But we do have some procedures that are required if the school district is asking, you know, the private clinician to do the eval. Um, the observation is is required to be a part of that. There's sort of some um, standards that uh, are expected. So. Um, so that's important. And that connection, you, if you've already got that connection, that relationship, 
um, that makes that all the more easy to go in there and be a part of the learning community as a team, right? Um, I, I'm wondering, uh, with your evaluations, I would love to talk a little bit about your testing psychologist community and then how your practice in particular, your focus went to evaluations versus um, uh, therapy for you as a practitioner. And then also, as we're talking about um, independent evaluations, maybe how many of your evaluations come from schools versus maybe clinical and, and family assessment kinds of things? Yeah, let's That's see. I'll uh, Sorry. <laughs> try to use the the recency effect and go backwards there. He's testing your working memory. <laughs> right, memory. right. I see what this is about here. <laughs> Sorry. Right. Um, let's see. So we, we don't do many IEEs, like formal IEEs. I'll probably get maybe two a year, if that. Um, that's not, I don't know if there's just not a big market in our area or if maybe they're going to other folks, I'm not sure. Um, so the majority is either parent referred or pediatrician referred. We get a lot of, you know, referrals from medical practices um, or word of mouth, or sometimes it's that uh, sort of informal school referral where, you know, teachers or a counselor may have uh, hinted that an evaluation perhaps being helpful if the parent chose to pursue it, you know, that kind of thing. Um, so that's the, yeah, the majority I'd say are just clinical or sort of outside um, referrals. And then as far as my transition to testing, um, that was, uh, gosh, I mean, it was a consequence, I think, of, of just recognize, know, of recognizing what works best for my personality. So, you know, I started out with a nice mixed practice where I was doing probably 20 or 25 therapy clients a week and then like a couple evaluations a month. Um, when our first kid came along, uh, I found that my emotional energy was uh, much less than it was before that and my, uh, you know, level of alertness and so forth. So, you know, when I figured out that I could do more testing and not have as many face-to-face -face hours and get to, you know, basically spend half my time just writing, um, that was very attractive. Um, and I found that it worked a lot better, better for the family. And it allowed me to have a much more flexible schedule. So um, I think, uh, you know, I think of it like it just took a long time to sort of circle back around to what I really am good at. You know, I always kind of joke with my wife that because uh, she's a therapist as well and she's like a real therapist, you know, she like actually helps people in therapy. I don't think I was a very good therapist. I think I should have maybe been like an engineer or maybe a computer programmer, but I got into psychology and testing is like as close as we can get to that. Um, so it worked a lot better for my personality and it was a great service to the community. So those kind of dovetailed and ended up working out. I think there was one more question before that, but I can't, I can't remember. My that, that was pretty good. <laughs> and, yeah. and I love that. I mean, I, I sort of am very similar, you know, I, I love chatting with kids and families and, but I think my skill is in assessment uh, a little, a little stronger than, you know, therapeutic intervention. Um, I tried working at an agency for one year, uh, just as I finished my, my master's and um, went right back to the school. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, and I love that idea that, you know, that engineering piece. I think we, those of us who really do love testing and assessment, um, there's something in that, you know, puzzle solving and um, so, something there that we connect with. Uh, well, so my other question was really about the community that you've built. So mm -hmm. you've really built this amazing network that, you know, of training others and supporting others um, in the field. So maybe I would love to hear more about the testing psychologist uh, community and your website and the work that you're doing there. Sure, sure. Yeah, it's been such an amazing journey to see where this has gone. So, you know, I talked at the beginning about starting the podcast uh, four or five years ago and, you know, the Facebook community right along that time too. And it was really just meant as a place for testing psychologists to come together and share thoughts and resources and give one another support. And, um, you know, when it started, it was me like private messaging my 20 psychologist friends from Facebook, like, hey, I did this thing, you know, join and, you know, say stuff so it looks like it's real, you know. And now, like a few years down the road, it's incredible. There's like thousands of psychologists in there. And every day it's 
awesome to see them. You know, they ask questions like somebody's always got an answer um, or a resource or uh, some emotional support. I mean, it's it's been incredible. And it's also let me, you know, just like like y'all have experienced, you know, just connect with these uh, experts in our field and ask them questions and they answer them. And it's like magic, you know, and then I get to share that with people. It's it's the coolest experience um, that, uh, of, you know, of the work that I do. It's it's incredible. I love that. Um, it's funny because I, I follow it frequently. And um, the other day or a couple of days ago, um, Dr. Reynolds had comment on something and then Dr. Bojan commented back and I was like those two like have I was just like all for it I was like watching this conversation between these two like amazingly brilliant um psychs and I'm so I'm talking to Erica back I'm like check out this conversation like it's so interesting and so um, I just love it it's it's fun it's so cool yeah yeah it's incredible to see those guys you know the, the these experts like jump in the group and are actually answering questions and you know a little bit of uh kind of freaking out you know fan fan person them, you know? Um, but yeah, I mean, it was really just born because I, like I said, in the beginning did not have any resources and especially with testing, you know, specifically there just wasn't a whole lot out there about how to, how to run a practice with assessment as a big component and I've just been fortunate that it seems like people are taking some benefit from it. For sure. I, I, we, you know, we're fa big fans of the podcast too. Mm -hmm. We, we, uh, there's been some episodes that I've, you know, saved for myself because I've learned so much and I like to go back. Um, so I recommend everyone out there check out um, the Testing Psychologist podcast. I want to uh, take a little turn because I have this viewer question that I think is a really good one. Um, the viewer asks, as a bilingual assessor, I want to I want to do private practice for both affluent and un underprivileged families. How do I learn what are appropriate fees? I know that in my area, um, different counties seem to have a different range. Um, and so if you're just starting out, maybe you'd be towards, you know, the middle or lower end of the range, depending on where you live. But um, how do you, how do you know? What, what are your thoughts on yeah, that? Yeah. Yeah. So I have a lot of thoughts. This is a big question. A lot of people, a lot of people ask. Um, so you can go about it in different ways. You certainly can do your market research. Just look on Psychology Today or look at websites and whatnot and see kind of what the going rate for assessment is. Um, but if you want to kind of serve the extreme, the extremes of the financial spectrum, you can go about it in a few different ways. I mean, you can do private pay and um, charge uh, a relatively high rate you know, that presumably would you know work for affluent families and then offer a certain number of pro bono spots each week or each month where you serve less affluent families. Right. So that's it's sort of the philosophy that, you know, you charge more where you can. And then that allows you to have the flexibility to charge less where you want to. So um, plenty of people, I think, take that approach. Um, you could do kind of a mixed model where you have a private pay rate um, that's you know, kind of the standard, but then you maybe you panel with your local, you know, your state Medicaid or um, um, if there's another, I don't know if there's another insurance panel that that might be more um, um, likely to you know help out lower SES families. Um, so you can do kind of a mixed, you know, selective insurance and, and private pay practice. Um, and then the other option is you can always just do an insurance based practice and, you know, try to um, try to pick the ones that serve you know, the populations that, that you're trying to, to work with. So I think there are some options, um, but people, you know, will often get locked into this whole, um, you know, I can't see underprivileged families if I'm private pay, but I, I totally disagree with that. I think it's actually, that actually gives you more flexibility, um, to, to do whatever you want with your underprivileged families and, uh, charge them as little as you would like. Right. You mentioned, um, you know, insurance companies. I seem to sometimes see people kind of griping a little bit about maybe some of them are difficult to work with. Can you tell us about that? Is it easy to work with insurance companies? Is it difficult? What's the paperwork like that involved? What are you getting into, I guess, with that? Mm, yes. Um, I'd say it's probably more difficult than easy if I had to really, you know, just sum it up. Um, so, I mean, there's the hassle, first of all, of getting on insurance panels. Uh, that 
you know, you do have to apply, you have to fill out credentials in a credentialing bank. Um, panels have their own paperwork. It can take anywhere from a month to I've heard six months to get paneled with insurance panels and all this varies uh, by panel and by state. Uh, so it's a, again, I use that term moving target. It's hard to kind of pin it down. So there's the initial hurdle to get over. That's, you know, if you can deal with that, then you get into the, the billing and the collecting and with testing, particularly therapy, I think is pretty easy. Um, because the codes are pretty straightforward and they don't often require pre-authorization. But billing insurance for testing, um, you can run into things like, well, for one, there are just like several codes that you have to uh, kind of master to bill insurance for testing. Um, so these are called CPT codes. It's you know what corresponds to the work you do and what signals to the insurance company what they should pay, basically. So that's hard. There are a lot of codes and it's taken a little bit to really dial, dial in the codes. Um, then you have the pre-authorization issue. Uh, so, you know, insurance panels get to tell you um, what diagnoses they will allow testing for and then how many hours they approve for you to do that testing. And, you know, of all the complaints about insurance, it seems like that's a big one is the, the intersection between hours approved and complexity of the evaluation uh, is not a pretty one often, oftentimes. So if folks are trying to figure out how to do more complex testing in fewer hours. Um, and then there's just the, you know, the broad um, principle, I guess, that when you enter a contract with an insurance company, you're agreeing to take less than your hourly rate most of the time. Um, and that seems to range anywhere from 50% of your private pay rate to maybe I mean, it could be, you know, 80 or 90 percent, depending on your area, but it seems to settle around maybe two thirds of the private pay rate. So you take a hit that way as well. Um, so it's it's tricky. It is tricky. If folks are, you know, if you want to do insurance and especially if you're a testing practice, um, I always recommend that you have a billing, at least a billing person uh, or a billing service, like a billing company to help you navigate that whole process because it can't take time. So a little bit complicated. I've done some podcasts on that and there's, yeah, there's certainly a lot of resources in the Facebook group around that too, but it's, uh, it's, it can be tough. It can be tough, but once you dial it in, it is fine. Like I said, we have an insurance based practice. We've done a lot of um, testing and experimenting. Um, with the insurance panels to know what they'll pay and how many hours and, and so forth. And we have it dialed in pretty well. So it can work. I know plenty of profitable insurance practices. Have the insurance companies become more flexible or more helpful during the pandemic because of the increase in need? Yeah, yeah, they have. Uh, the biggest thing that I've seen come out of it is that a lot of them have waived copays for telehealth appointments. Yeah, so uh, so that's a nice a nice little perk. Um, they have not become more flexible on uh, pre authorizations for testing or hours they've approved or anything like that. But but they become more flexible with telehealth and copays. Yeah, uh, we had a good viewer question too from Nick um, that I wanted to show up here um, about you know uh, in your practice how do you uh, change your approach for diverse clients. And I'm wondering too, if you're overseeing a bunch of um, psychologists and, uh, you know, psych associates and whatnot, um, as the kind of the boss and whatnot, are, are you guys going through like diversity trainings? Are you doing, I mean, the schools right now are revving up a lot just um, because of things going on. There's, you know, book clubs and discussions and all sorts of stuff. Are the private, uh, is the private world kind of involved in that self-study type of piece and, and training and, and learning in that area? Yes. Yes. Sense. Yeah, certainly. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, the sh I think we all are, um, are, are really, you know, ramping up that, that part of our practices. Um, and that's a, that's a really good question and a really hard question to answer. <laughs> um, one, because I'm not an expert in this area by any means. There are people out there who have made careers out of studying, uh, you know, testing and assessment with uh, diverse clients. So um, I don't want to, to misspeak by any means. But 
I think the short story is just that, you know, we try to take each client's, um, each client's unique presentation into account um, at all times. So that could be, you know, obviously uh, diverse clients. It could be, you know, um, clients where it's, it's not as obvious, right? So um, we're just trying to meet everybody where they're at. I know that's a silly kind of canned answer, but, you know, it just, it is hard. It is hard. Like, you know, working with minority kids where there's a question of ADHD is, is different than working with minority kids where there's a question of autism, you know, but it's all like in the big picture, just trying to take into account, um, gosh, I mean, family environment, um, background, socioeconomic, I mean, it's just everything. It's, that's a really hard question to answer, but yes, we try to approach people differently depending on what they're bringing in the room. So, you know, that Pamela, you know, Pamela Hayes, the addressing framework, I don't know if y'all have come across that or um, that's a model that comes up a lot and I think is, can really inform uh, just, yeah, working with diverse clients. It kind of walks you through a number of different dimensions to, to consider, which has been helpful. But it's, well, sorry, I might add one more thing. I mean, the, the overlay, I think at least over the last six to eight months, especially as we've been testing remotely. And we kind of talked about this the last time y'all were on my podcast is just that, uh, that gap that seems to continue to grow, you know, between um, the haves and the have nots, right? So um, the learning gap, the access to technology gap. Um, so we've just been a lot more cognizant, I think of those factors, um, yeah, over the last few months. Um, I'm also kind of thinking um, when people are first getting started, um, I mean, typically I would say, you know, you need to get an office. We're not going to be testing um, out of our garages type of thing. But now with, with COVID, people are testing or doing things um, right in, uh, in their homes. Do you think that there's a place for somebody who wants to open up like a private practice and, and do the teleworking thing? Or do you think that people need like an office space in order to be legitimate? And then I also wanted to tack on... Um, test kits and things when you're starting out. Obviously, you know, in the schools, we have them all paid for us. And it's like, here's your test kit. Or if we're lucky enough, it's here's your test kit. You can use it or what test kits do you need? Uh, test kits are expensive. And so I'm, I'm guessing that you have to kind of plan that out. What is most important to start off with um, when spending your money? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, I think there's I think there is a place for remote testing and I think we're probably going to be doing more of it even after the pandemic than, than we were before. Uh, at the same time, I think that it's pretty well agreed upon that remote testing is not ideal. You know, if at least given the resources that we have right now in terms of test administration um, methods, the vast majority of our tests were not designed to be administered remotely. And so we're just compromising you know, the, the validity and standardization there. Um, so until we get to that point, I mean, I, I think, I think we're still going to lean toward in-person testing as much as we can. Um, but you know, rural areas or areas where there's less access to services, um, there's definitely a place for it. And that's really that question of like, is something better than nothing? And I, I say yes, but, um, if you have the option, I think testing in person is probably the best practice. Yeah. And then to your other question in terms of starting up and test kit cost, this is another thing. I mean, I, uh, you know, my poor wife, I drag her into these presentations so much, but you know, we had, I remember that conversation when I went to her and was like, I think I'm going to need about $15,000, um, tomorrow to buy all this stuff. <laughs> and she's like, what? Oh my God. You know? Um, so back then, you know, there was no Q interactive, um, and no means of like pay per use or Q global, you know, stuff like that. So yeah, you just bite the bullet and, you know, try to get like a zero interest credit card for the first year or something. Um, that's one way to do it. But I mean, these days Q interactive really goes a long way, um, toward helping with costs. And I know there are mixed feelings about Q interactive and whether it's appropriate or valid and all of those concerns. So I don't want to dive into that, but, it can be a cost effective way to get started where you're just paying that $300 licensing fee and you have access to a lot of the tests that a lot of us use. You can form a pretty comprehensive battery and you just pay as you go instead of committing to a whole kit, right? 
Um, now, if you're, you know, uh, doing autism assessment, there's no way to get around buying the ADOS. Um, if you want to use the ADOS, that's pretty expensive, but you might have to buy a few things here and there, but Q Interactive can help a lot. Um, I did, I worked with Pearson to develop a uh, little like cost calculator. And I think we found that the tipping point over the course of five years is if you're averaging more than two evaluations a week, then it's more cost effective to buy paper. But if you're doing less than two evaluations a week, Q Interactive is going to be more cost effective for you. So, yeah, I mean, especially starting out, I think as you're ramping up, it's easy to put out a thousand dollars versus 50. It strikes me that it requires a lot of courage. <laughs> it seems, you know, <laughs> but it worked out so beautifully for you. And I also think your wife sounds like a rock star. So I'd love yeah. to give her a shout out. <laughs> she is absolutely a rock star. <laughs> yes. You know, it raises a, a it makes me think of something though, uh, Rebecca, when you say that, which is, I think a lot of us, especially if you're coming from an agency, like the financial part is so scary and it's like, oh my God, like you spent $15,000 on testing overnight. Like how do you do, um, or my office is going to be a thousand dollars a month, you know, like the numbers start to add up and it gets really scary and I always try to work with people. I, you know, I say like a lot of anxiety can be solved with math and, you know, that number or the number, like they get overwhelming, but a lot of the time, if we can just like break it down and divide by, you know, how many clients you would have to see, it actually becomes a lot more manageable when you realize that, yeah, it might cost $15,000, but you know, if you bring in 1500 per assessment, that's going to pay off pretty easy, you know, three or four, six months. I mean, yeah. So it's not, not super, not as scary. As that. That's great for schools too. You know, we're, we're all sort of those of us who haven't gone to um, iPads and, and Q Interactive yet. Uh, we're trying to figure out what that's going to cost and what that'll look like, you know, buying, you know, $8,000 in protocols next year versus, you know, buying the licenses and the iPads and all of that. So um, that's good to consider, uh, you know, calculating the cost. That'll, that'll help us make that decision. Sure. Sure. Yeah, I'm not sure if y'all, if you do show notes or resources or anything, but I'm happy to give you the public version of that cost calculator, if that would be helpful. Yeah, yeah that would be great. Awesome. Thank you. Um, I posted kind of a last call uh, for questions. Uh, anybody watching that, that has anything? Mm -hmm. um, but any other, can you think of any other words of wisdom for somebody that might be kind of embarking up upon this other than of course i think everyone needs to listen to your podcast to get more in depth <laughs> with with some of the stuff yeah. but um any like common mistakes that you see um either on the message boards or, or just in in general oh gosh yeah yeah i mean there there's there are a few there are a few um i mentioned earlier just that that whole thing of getting busier than you want to be um which seems like a, a far cry from starting out, you know, but it happens quickly. And especially, you know, if you are doing testing, we get stuck in this trap of um, not making time to write reports. That's probably the biggest thing. That's the biggest complaint and or request is like, how do I streamline my reports? How do I do this faster? Because people aren't setting aside time to write reports in their schedule because it's not face to face hours. So it's so easy to just book, you know, your week with face-to-face -face appointments and then not save time for report writing. Um, that's probably one of the biggest. And then the other is just, you know, the financial piece, especially if you're taking insurance. Um, but even if you're not, it's uh, I always, you know, I, I, I tell people often that there is a lot of emotional energy wrapped up in money and people have different relationships with money. And so, doing, I think it's worth it to do some of your own work around money and attitudes toward money and um, setting boundaries around money and things like that. Um, 
or else you're going to get yourself in trouble. You know, you're going to like not charge cancellation fees or not collect if somebody has a bigger balance than they expected, or uh, if they don't pay for services, you're still going to want to give them the report. You know, there's a, there are a lot of ways that money really gets in the way um, and emotions really get in the way. That's, that's probably what it's about. So yeah, those are just, those are just a couple. Um, but for me, I mean, the, it, it's totally worth it. It is totally worth it. You know, I, I can never, I don't think I could ever go to a job. You know, I, I don't, I don't, I don't know. That's it, the flexibility is incredible. Um, the um, ability to really make all your own decisions is really nice. Um, financially, you know, it's more beneficial. You can generally work about half as much and make the same amount or you know, flip that, work the same amount and make twice as much. Um, so there are a lot of advantages to, to private practice. My schedule has changed so much over the years, you know, from working all the, all the days, all the hours to three days a week to four days a week to whatever. I mean, you know, you can do whatever you want. And for me, that's valuable. I love that. <laughs> just, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'll retire from my school district eventually, but, uh, you know, I, I'll stay in the field, I'm sure, in some area, you know, and, and just there's a lot of perks to, um, you know, being able to work for yourself. And it sounds great. And you, you've set such a good example, Jeremy, of uh, how you've done this and then just helping others do the same. So uh, we appreciate the testing psychologist, your website, your Facebook page, and your podcast. It's really been great. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks so much. I mean, this is a fantastic opportunity. I love hanging out with y'all and I just appreciate the the venue here to, to talk with y'all. Yeah. Yeah. What do you think about the live format? I know you're not live when you do your podcasts. It's true. Yeah. I mean, I was <laughs> uh, scared before, <laughs> before we got got onto this thing but we are yeah. intimidating <laughs> you, you are totally intimidating that's a big part no it's a i i do like live because i love the live questions this is really cool you know that's the thing with podcasting you're just sort of like talking into the void and hoping somebody listens when you release it right like i like this uh this feedback where people are you know it's more interactive that's that's really cool for sure. All right. So I want to remind people our next podcast that we've got uh, coming up is on January 3rd. And we have uh, Dr. Julie coming to talk about trauma. So um, hope to see everybody there. I don't think we have any last questions. Any last thoughts or we're good, everybody? <laughs> I think so. Thank you so much again. This is awesome. And Thank you so much, Jeremy. Oh, Great to yes. see you. Thank you Great. all. Happy holidays. Yes. Happy holidays, everyone.